This is the second video lecture for section 2.3 on the Condorcet method. In this lecture, I'll be talking about the Condorcet winner criterion. So in the previous lecture, we learned about the Condorcet method, which tells us to look at voter preference lists and find the winner of each pairwise election. So that means that we match each of the candidates up one by one, one against each other, and all of those pairs and see who wins. And the candidate that beats all of their opponents in the pairwise elections, we call them the Condorcet winner. And the, con and the candidate that loses all of their pairwise elections, we call them the Condorcet loser. But there's a problem. A major flaw with the Condorcet method is that sometimes we don't get a winner. We just don't get a candidate that beats all of their opponents one on one. And so we wouldn't be able to declare a winner using that method. And this kind of situation we call a Condorcet paradox. So let's see an example of how the Condorcet paradox can happen. We've got a voter profile here, and let's remember how we read this. So this means we have 10 voters who have A as their top choice, B as their second choice, and C as their third choice. Nine voters who like B the best, C second best, and A least, and eight voters who like C the best, then A, and then B. And again, let's remember how we do the Condorcet method. So we look at all of the pairings of these candidates against each other. So we would have A versus B, we would have A versus C, and we would have B versus C. And for each of these groups of voters that all have the same preference, we see which of those candidates in each of these pairs would those voters go for. So let's look at A versus B. The 10 voters at the top, they like A the best, so of course they're going to vote for A if they get the chance. The nine voters in the second row of my table, they like B the best, so of course they're going to vote for B. The eight voters in the third row of my table, well, they would like to vote for C, but right now we're looking at A versus B, so they can't vote for C. So instead, they would vote for their second choice, which is A. So that's eight more votes for A. And if we add these up, A wins this pair 18 to 9. So A would be the winner of that matchup. Now, if we look at A versus C, A is going to get 10 votes from the first group of voters. The eight voters in the third row of my table, they're all going to vote for C. But the nine voters, they can't vote for B, who is their top choice. So instead, they're going to vote for their second choice, which is C. So C wins that matchup 17 to 10. So C wins the A versus C election. And similarly, for the B versus C election, the 10 voters at the top, they vote for their second choice because they can't vote for A right now. The nine voters in the second row of the table, they vote for B. And then the eight voters who like C the best, they vote for C. And so 19 to 8, 19 is more than 8. So B wins that matchup. So what we see is that we had three matchups, and each of them was won by a different candidate. We didn't get any candidate that beat all of their opponents. A beat B, but lost to C. B beat C, but lost to A. C beat A, but lost to B. So there is no winner. And so imagine what would happen if we actually decided to use this method in a real election, or especially a prominent national election, where it's not just that we don't know the winner yet or that we haven't figured it out yet, but literally that we counted all the votes, we analyzed everything, and we just don't have a winner. There is no candidate that we can declare the winner. However, if there is a Condorcet winner, if this paradox thing doesn't happen, then it's natural to think that the Condorcet winner should be the winner of the election no matter what method we use. That Condorcet winner is the candidate who would beat each of their opponents, every single one of their opponents, one-on-one. -on -one. So it would sort of make sense to say, well, if there is a candidate like that, a candidate who would beat all of their opponents one-on-one, -on -one, then no matter what method we're actually using, we should probably declare that person the winner. So this is the idea behind the Condorcet winner criterion. So whatever method we're using, let's just call it method X for the moment. So whatever method we're using, it could be plurality voting or one of the other methods that we're going to learn later in this unit, we're going to say that that method satisfies the Condorcet winner criterion if, whenever there is a Condorcet winner, the method we're using determines the same winner as the Condorcet winner. Or in other words, our method gives a winner that matches the Condorcet winner when there is a Condorcet winner. And there isn't always a Condorcet winner, but when there is one, we want our method to give that same answer. So the plurality method that we typically use in our elections in the United States does not satisfy the Condorcet winner criterion. And the example is the example that we looked at in the previous lecture, the milk and soda and juice election. We figured out that soda was the Condorcet winner. So the Condorcet winner was soda. Soda beat all of their opponents one-on-one. -on -one. But the plurality winner of this election is milk. 
Milk gets six votes, because remember, plurality says ignore all of this junk, right? Plurality says you only get to vote for your top choice. Six votes for milk, five votes for soda, four votes for juice. Six is the biggest number, so milk is the plurality winner. So because we got a plurality winner that didn't match the Condorcet winner, plurality does not satisfy the CWC, the Condorcet winner criteria. So we only need one example to do that. So if we're analyzing a voting method, rather than voting, uh, analyzing a particular election, but if we're analyzing a method of voting, one example that doesn't work, one example where our method that we're thinking about doesn't match the Condorcet method in terms of which winner is declared, that's all we need to show that that method doesn't satisfy the Condorcet winner criterion. But to show that a method does satisfy the Condorcet winner criterion, that's a lot harder because we would have to know that no matter what, no matter what that voter profile looks like, the winner that's declared by our method that we're thinking about would always, no matter what, match the Condorcet method. And that's a lot harder to prove, right? And that's really what we would have to do. We would have to convince ourselves. We would have to sort of explain, okay, so even if this happens or even if that happens, so all, think, consider all possibilities to show that no matter what, our method would give an answer that matches the Condorcet method. So that's a lot of a higher bar that we would have to pass. So if we look ahead in the next several sections, we're going to look at many more methods for finding the winner of an election, right? Right now, so far, we've only really looked at plurality and the Condorcet method, but there's a lot more out there that we're going to look at. And we're going to consider additional fairness criteria. The, the Condorcet winner criterion is our first way of measuring up an election method to find out how good it is or how fair it is. And our ultimate goal is to try to find the best voting method, a voting method that satisfies all of our fairness criteria and gives us the best answer for who the winner of an election should be.